Hey everybody, Mr. Judson here. So we want to talk about uh, something called concavity today. It has to do with the direction um, that a curve faces. You know, like if we have a parabola that looks like this, that's considered concave up. The curve is facing upwards. Or an upside down parabola would be concave down. So sometimes it's, it's almost easier just to describe this with examples so that we understand what we're talking about. So we're going to look at, at functions and, and try to decide are they concave up or are they concave down. And so here's an example of each of those. If I have an xy axis and I have a graph that looks like this, so that looks like a, an exponential function that's showing decay, that's concave up. Okay, because if you go to the inside of the curve here and, and you try to draw um, a line that would be perpendicular to the tangent line, that line is, is pointing up. Okay, now of course, something like a parabola, that makes sense, that's concave up. A lot of times people say, you know, if it's a bowl that'll hold water, it's concave up. Well, that's not going to hold water, it's all just going to run off the end, um, but it's still concave up. Okay? Um, let's see, another example of concave up, if I, if I had a graph that looked like this, so when we graphed this last year, we said there's a point of inflection here. This part right here is concave up. Okay, This part would be concave down. So I'll just kind of cross that off. That's not an example of concave up. If I come over here, um, so certainly an upside down parabola, that would be considered concave down. If I had a graph where, let's say, I had an exponential function, but there's an asymptote here, and the graph goes like this, that would be concave down. And, and then also, you know, kind of taking this idea, if I, if I had a function with a graph that went like this, this right here is our point of inflection. This part right here would be concave down. That would not count because it's concave up. Okay? So we, we call this a point of inflection. And, and that's a, a pretty important point to us in, in calculus. Because a, a point of inflection is the point at which a graph would change from concave up to concave down. Okay, same thing over here on, on this one. Um, another example of a, a point of inflection where we change concavity is if, if I was graphing a function that looked like this. Okay, there's my point of inflection right here. This part of the graph is concave down. This part is concave up. So something else that you might also notice here is anytime you have a relative maximum, your function is concave down. And anytime you have a relative minimum, your, your function is concave up. Okay? So, you know, how do we find that point of inflection so that we can determine where the concavity changes? And uh, this works out really nice for us. Um, a point of inflection occurs I think that's how you spell that when f double prime of x equals zero. If we take our second derivative and set it equal to zero, that tells us where points of inflection are 
and where our concavity switches from maybe concave up to concave down or vice versa. Okay? So, you know, when we've been practicing doing the second derivative now and then and not really knowing what it was for, well, now we know. It's a, it's a point at which concavity um, changes. And, and it, it's really important in the business world uh, because a, a point of inflection can tell you where um, a, a trend in your business is, is maybe either getting better or maybe it's getting worse. <laughs> All right? So, you know, if you look at a graph like this, if this is a company, let's say their sales was going up, but then all of a sudden it started going down, um, this is a point of concern. But the moment you hit that point of inflection, it means that that downward acceleration has begun to slow down, and we've begun to start to turn the other way. Okay? We've heard this a lot with COVID, you know, can we, can we flip the curve? Can we turn the curve the other way? That's what they're looking for is a point of inflection where rather than seeing um, infection rates going up, can we do something to kind of level that out? Even though they're going up, they're not going up as fast. We've begun to turn the curve, okay? And, and so, you know, for most people they say that, don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> but the math people that are analyzing everything, they do know. That's, that's important to them, okay? All right. So, this is what we want to look at today is finding points of inflection, but also finding where a curve is concave up and, and concave down. All right, so let's just start with this. We, we won't even talk about points of inflection or concavity yet. Let's just see if we can find the second derivative of that function. All right, you guys go ahead and give it a shot. All right, so my first derivative, I've got a quotient rule. So I've got to do low d high, which is 1, less high d low, that's 2x, all over low squared will go, x to the fourth. And so that means I've got x squared. If I distribute both of these, I'd get a negative 2x times this. That's a negative 2x squared. And a negative 2x times this, that's a negative 6x, all over x to the fourth. And if I simplify that, um, let's see, that's going to be a negative x squared minus 6x over x to the fourth. I could factor an x out of both of those and cancel it with 1 down here. So that would become a negative x minus 6 over x to the third. There's my first derivative. All right, so now I've got to find the second derivative. So f double prime of x, I'm going to have to do another quotient rule. So low d high less high d low all over x squared, or low squared will go, so that would be x to the sixth power. So again, we'll just clean this up a little bit, and let's see, that's going to be a negative x cubed. Here I've got a negative 3x squared times a negative x, so that would be a positive 3x cubed. And then a negative 3x squared times this, that would be a positive 18x squared, all over x to the sixth power. And if I add my like terms together, I would get 2x cubed plus 18x squared over x to the sixth. And I could factor 2x's out of each of those and cancel it with 2x's on the bottom. So that makes this 2x plus 18 over x to the fourth. There's my second derivative. So if I was looking for the point of inflection, I would just say, where does this equal 0? Negative 18 divided by 2, that would be negative 9. So at x equals negative 9, this function would have a point of inflection. And that's the spot at which the concavity would change. Okay? So point of inflection at x equals negative 18 divided by 2, negative 9. 
Okay, that's where your second derivative equals zero. And so what I want to do is just take a look at the graph and see if that is in fact where we see a point of inflection. Okay. All right, so if I, if I want to check that, um, I need to go back to the original function, which was x plus 3 over x squared. And so I'll pull up my calculator. And it's funny, I already had this function in here. This must have been something we worked with the other day. Um, x plus 3 over x squared. Uh, if you remember, when I go to the graph, this was one of those things that it went through the x-axis, which was the an asymptote, and then turned and went back up and got close without touching. So we were kind of examining that, um, that idea right there. But if, if I hit the trace button, so F3, and I go out to where x equals negative 9, which is right there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just go back to the graph because it's covering up what we want to see. Graph. No, come on, escape, there we go. So negative nine was right about here, and that's where the concavity changes. So let me draw this picture right here and just exaggerate what we're seeing, okay? So if I took uh, an x and a y axis here, what we saw was this graph coming down and then turning and going back up, and then getting close to the asymptote without touching. So we can tell it's concave up right here, it's concave down right here, and our point of inflection is right about there. And, and according to the work we just did, that's at x equals negative 9. Now it's really hard to see that in, in this graph um, because it's so slow at getting back up there that it's just really difficult to see um, that concavity. Unless we really change our window here. You know, if we changed our y values so that we're doing something like uh, we're going from negative 0.1 to positive 0.1, and then we graph that, maybe we can see a little bit better. Well, I, I can definitely see the concave up right here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I can barely see the curve turning this way. Not, not very fast. I'd almost have to go back and say, let's see, window, let's just go from um, negative 1 to 0. Now you can start to see a little bit more. We can see that curvature just a little bit here. And then here it's, it's curving up, so this is concave up, this is concave down. Now if I hit trace and go to negative 9, well, that's, that's where it changes. That's where that concavity changes. All right. All right. So we're we're going to get um, questions like this, where they give us a function and they ask us to discuss the concavity. <laughs> Sit around and have a discussion about the concavity. What what they want us to do is they they when they say discuss it, it's kind of like when when uh, we were saying, well, where is a, a function increasing or decreasing? You know, it's increasing on these intervals, and it's decreasing on these intervals. Therefore, I know I've got a maximum minimum. We, we use what was called the first derivative test to do that. Now we're going to use the second derivative test, which is very close to the same as the first derivative test. So there's, there's not a lot of stuff to learn here. We just need to understand how it works. But we need to do that second derivative test in order to be able to discuss the concavity like we know what we're talking about. All right? So, the first step is we have to get to the second derivative, set it equal to zero to find our critical numbers. Or, where is the second derivative undefined? Okay? Yeah, boy, it'd be nice if we had a, a little more user-friendly function, but we didn't get that. So, f prime of x is going to be low d high less high d low all over low squared will go. And remember that is not x to the fourth plus 16. Right? We don't want to do bad algebra. I do need to simplify the numerator though, so what I'm going to get here is uh, 2x cubed plus 8x 
Here I'll get minus 2x cubed and then minus 2x all over x squared plus 4 to the second power. And then I guess this is kind of nice when things go away. I've got 8x minus 2x, that's 6x over x squared plus 4 squared. There's my first derivative. So if I was looking for the critical numbers to do the first derivative test, 0 would be the only one, right? Because this is not undefined anywhere. No matter what, that denominator is always positive. So I guess, in a sense, that's kind of nice. We didn't have a ton of points to work with. But now I need to move on to the second derivative. So f double prime of x is equal to low d high. d high is 6, less high d low. So i got to do a chain rule, right? So bring the 2 down in front, subtract 1 from the exponent, um, times the derivative of the inside. Okay, so that's, let's see, low d high less high d low, all that stuff, all over low squared will go. So now I've got x squared plus 4 to the 4th power. And, and one thing that I see here is I've got an x squared plus 4 in both of these terms and in one right here. So that means I can get, get rid of one of those in each term. So this is going to become x squared plus 4 times 6. If I multiply all this stuff, I've got 2 times 2, that's 4, times 6, that's 24, x times x. That one got canceled, one of those got canceled, one of these gets canceled. So this is now cubed. And so let's see, if I distribute this, I would get 6x squared plus 24 minus 24x squared all over x squared plus 4 cubed. And if I add my like terms, I now have 24. I'll write that first just because it's positive. And then minus 18 x squared over x squared plus 4 to the third power. There's my second derivative. You know, these, these are long problems. You know, I, I just did a lot of work just to get to the second derivative, and I haven't even begun to do what they've asked me yet. We haven't talked about concavity. Okay? So, yeah, i got to do that. Um, so now I need to set this equal to zero and solve. Okay? Points of inflection happen when the second derivative is equal to zero. So, um, I, I don't like doing this because I'm saying the second derivative always equals zero, but I don't want to write this again. I'm being lazy. If I set this equal to zero and solve, the only way a fraction equals zero is when the numerator equals zero. Right? We can just think I'm going to bring this over here and multiply, get zero. So now what I've got is 24 minus 18x squared equals zero. I'll go ahead and move this term to the other side. So I get 24 equals 18x squared. And then I'll divide by 18, so I get x squared equals, uh, what is that, 24 over 18, I can divide by 6 and get 4 thirds. Take the square root of that, x equals plus or minus the square root of 4 thirds, which is plus or minus 2 over root 3. Remember, we're okay staying like that, but if you're taking the AP test, they're going to want you to simplify it. So we probably ought to at least make sure we don't forget that. Um, that would be 2 root 3 over 3. So there are my critical numbers. So remember, critical numbers happen when the, when the derivative equals 0. So in this case, the second derivative equals 0. Or where it's undefined. 
This is not undefined anywhere. There's no number you can plug in that'll make this denominator equal zero. So we're okay with any number getting plugged into this. So now that means uh, I need to set up my second derivative test, which, which is almost identical to the first derivative test. The only thing that's different is the conclusion at the end. First derivative test tells you whether you're increasing or decreasing. Second derivative test tells you whether you're concave up or concave down. But it looks exactly the same. All right. All right. For my second derivative test, I'm going to set up some intervals here, where I go from negative infinity to a negative two root three over three, and then I've got an interval that is negative two root three over three to a positive two root three over three. And then I've got an interval that goes from 2 root 3 over 3 to infinity. And then I'm going to need a test number. I'm going to look for a sign. And then I'm going to draw a conclusion but the difference here is we're going to write concave up or concave down as opposed to increasing or decreasing. That's the first derivative test. All right, so I need some number in this interval. I have no idea what this is. So I'm going to pick a number way out there. Let's just go with a negative 100. Okay? I know a number in this interval would be 0, and a number in this interval, positive 100. Okay? I'm pretty sure that this number is not equal to 100. It's less than that. So if I just go way out there on the interval, I'm okay. Now, if these intervals were a little bit smaller, I might have to figure out what that decimal is so that I can pick you know, a number that really fits in that interval. Okay. But I think we're okay with this. And I want to plug that back into my second derivative, which is right here. Okay. So if I plug a negative 100 in there, no matter what, this is going to be positive. We can't make it equal zero. We're going to square some number, add four to it, we get a big positive number, and then cube it and we get a bigger positive number. So really all I care about is the numerator. What's happening there? If I plug a negative 100 in for x, I'm going to get, uh, what is that, 10,000 times a negative 18, so I've got a negative 180,000, 24 minus 180,000, Pretty safe to say that's negative. So I've got a negative divided by a positive. That's negative. And it means that this graph is concave down. Okay. Um, I think I usually abbreviate this just C down or C up, just because it's a small space to write this. So concave down. If I plug a positive 100 in, I think the exact same thing's going to happen. Square it, you get 10,000. Multiply it by negative 18, you get a negative 180,000. 24 minus all that, big negative number. Divided by a positive number, we're still negative. So our graph is concave down over here as well. If I plug in a zero, I get zero right there. So I got positive 24 over a positive number. That's positive. So here we are, concave up. I'm not asking you to graph these today. All right. The only thing we're doing is discussing the concavity. And so what I want to say now is this graph, or f of x, whatever that function was a long time ago, I don't remember, is concave down on the intervals negative infinity to negative 2 root 3 over 3, and on the interval 2 root 3 over 3 to positive infinity. You'll never see brackets here, all right? Because at the point of inflection, you are neither concave up or concave down. That's where it's kind of neutral, all right? Kind of like with a, a relative maximum, you know, when you hit the top of that graph, you're neither increasing or decreasing, 
your neutral at that high point or the low point. And f of x is concave up on the interval negative 2 root 3 over 3 to positive 2 root 3 over 3. There it is. I have discussed the concavity. Okay. Now, one more thing. Whenever your concavity changes from down to up or from up to down, that means there's a point of inflection right there at that spot. So at negative 2 root 3 over 3 comma something, we've got a point of inflection. And right here at 2 root 3 over 3 comma something, we have another point of inflection. Okay? This is all they're going to ask us for today. Let me give you guys one that's a whole lot easier than this. Okay? All right, so this is a little bit nicer. <laughs> Not quite as, as nasty. So our steps here are we want to find f double prime of x. We've got to get to the second derivative. Second thing is we want to find the critical numbers. And that's where f double prime of x equals 0 or undefined. And once we get that information, then we're going to do the second derivative test. Okay? So, you guys go ahead and try it on this one. Alright, so f prime of x, if I bring that down and multiply, I get a negative 15x to the fourth. Uh, subtracted one from the exponent. Here when I multiply, I get 15x squared. That was quick and easy. Second derivative. Multiply, you get a negative 60x cubed. Multiply here, you get plus 30x. And now I want to set that equal to zero and solve. I already like this problem better than the other one. So, let's see, if I factor out, um, I'm going to factor out a negative 30x. That means I'm left with 2x squared. Uh, not plus 1, minus 1. Okay, when I multiply that back, a negative times a negative, that'll give me a positive. And I want to set that equal to 0. And so that means my critical numbers are at x equals 0, or x squared would equal positive 1 over 2, which means x would equal plus or minus the square root of 1 half, which is plus or minus 1 over root 2, which means x equals plus or minus root 2 over 2. And again, I don't care if you guys leave it like that. You can leave it that way if you want. So I've got three critical numbers. There, and there's two. So now I need to do my second derivative test. So I'll set up my intervals. I've got from negative infinity to, I'll hit a negative root 2 over 2 first, and I'm going to go from negative root 2 over 2 to 0, and then from 0 to a positive root 2 over 2, and then from root 2 over 2 to infinity. And I need a conclusion. Make sure we always put this in parentheses, that we're not just writing down negative root 2 over 2 comma 0. 
Because the moment you take the parentheses away, this is no longer an interval. It's just two numbers that are listed there. All right? We want to make sure we write things correctly. It's, it's kind of like, I mean, I, I'm probably not the one to talk about this, but spelling, you know? Depending on what you do for a living, <laughs> if you're a math teacher, it's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, depending on what you do for a living, you want to make sure you spell your words correctly. You don't want to look like you don't know how to spell. Like I do. All right, so let's at least write down our intervals the, the right way. All right, so I need a number that's inside here. Um, I kind of need to know what root 2 over 2 is as a, as a number. So let me just check that real quick. Go to my home screen, clear that. I want the square root of 2 divided by 2. Uh, great. 0.707. Okay, so about 0.71. Um, so, if this is a negative 0.71, if I chose something like a negative 2, I'm going to be fine there. So, from negative 0.7 to 0, probably want to choose something like a negative 0 0.5, and then a positive 0 0.5, and then here I'll choose 2. Okay? And we're going to plug those back into this form of our second derivative right here, the factored form. Okay? Oops. There we go. So if I plug in a negative 2, negative times a negative, that's positive. If I take a negative 2 and square it, I get 4. Times 2 is 8, minus 1, that's positive. Times a positive, this is positive. So we are concave up. I'll get that in a second. If I put a negative 0 0.5, I've got a negative times a negative, that's positive. 0.5 squared is like 0.25, it's like 1 fourth. Okay, think of this as a half. Square that, you get a fourth. Multiply, you get two fourths, which reduces down to 1 half minus 1. That's a negative number. So I got a negative times a negative times a negative. That's three negatives overall. That means that's negative, so we are concave down. And I try 0.5. So negative times a positive. Here I'm going to get the same thing, 1 half squared is 1 fourth, 2 times a fourth is 2 fourths, which is 1 half minus 1, that's a negative number. So negative times a positive times a negative, that's positive, so we're concave up. And then if I put a 2 in there, I've got a negative times a positive, this will be 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, minus 1, that's 7, so a negative times a positive times a positive, that's negative, so we are concave down. So concave up, concave down, concave up, concave down. Um, let's, let's not, I mean this happens every year, people start going CU, CD, CU, CD. We try to abbreviate these things as far as we can. I'm already getting lazy here, okay? Let's not be super lazy. Let's at least write up or down. I want to see those words. Um, when you do C dash up, we, just, we know that means concave, so um, we'll, we'll get the picture there. But we should at least get the word up or down in there. All right, so now I need to discuss the concavity. So on this function, f of x is concave up on the intervals negative infinity to negative root 2 over 2. And we're also concave up from 0 to root 2 over 2. And concave down on the intervals negative root 2 over 2 to 0 and root 2 over 2 to infinity. Alright, there it is. We discussed the concavity. And it was a good discussion, right? <laughs> Alright, th that's really it for today. Um, you know, we, we had to do this because, uh, you know, time-wise, we're really limited when we get back from break. You know, we've got a pretty tight schedule to, to get our Central Washington test in. I mapped it all out today, so I think we're good to go. 
Um, but it meant I really had to get this to you guys before we went on break. So sorry about that, <laughs> but this is it. We just got to get this one assignment done. Um, and that's just being able to discuss the concavity or figure out where a point of inflection is. You're only going to get those two kind of questions. Where are the points of inflection and, where, and, and discuss the concavity? That's all we got to do. Okay? All right, let me get you guys a homework assignment. <clears throat> all right, you guys, uh, here it is, uh, number 14. This is our Thursday piece. Um, page 196, we're going to do 5, 7, 13, 17, 21, and 23. And this will be due Wednesday next week. Okay, I know this is during break. Um, some people are probably wondering, why don't I make it due the Wednesday after break? Well, because I know what will happen. We'll all put it off till the end and won't remember what to do. Um, so we'll get this done. Um, get it turned in any time before Wednesday, and, and then you're on break, and you don't have to think about math for a while. All right? You guys take care, stay safe, um, have a good Christmas, uh, hope you enjoy your time off, rest, relax, all those, those good things. Alright, take care you guys, I'll see you after the new year. Alright, bye.